without further delay, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker uh, for this session, who is going to speak on 10 practical ways to get started with Google Analytics. Yeah, Ms. Alitza Sen. Uh, sh a little bit brief about uh, herself. Um, she is a co-founder and managing partner in uh, Sparkline. Sparkline was created to provide companies with a strategic, transparent and practical approach to digital, di digital analytics. Before starting uh, Sparkline, Alitza spent over nine and a half years in a range of customer-focused strategic roles uh, within Google. She was the sixth person hired in Google's Australia office and the first YouTube employee in the Asia-Pacific region. Driven to produce exceptional results, she managed many of the region's Fortune uh, 500 clients and helped each in developing digital strategy across the business with a keen focus on digital marketing in search, display, video, social, and finally mobile. Alitza brings deep experience in branding strategy, marketing consulting, and organizational development. So without further delay, please welcome Ms. Alitza. Thank you. It's quite loud. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks. That's uh, always a very large introduction, so I hope I live up to it. <laughs> um, the, the brief for this session uh, was very much centred around Google Analytics, but when, uh, when we talk to customers about measurement in general, and especially as I know a lot of you in the room are entrepreneurs or starting out your business, I wanted to um, put a little bit of a spin on that and talk a little bit about measurement in general and some things that you can do either as you're starting your business or um, you're starting to think about how to uh, measure or, or your measurements of success if you've been given funding etc that you can go away with today and really start thinking about. So today's about being very practical um, and trying to give you uh, things that you can take with you tonight and you can experiment with or that you can further discuss with, uh, with your teams. Okay, um, so a little bit about uh, Sparkline as a business. We started the business in uh, May 2013 with the premise of um, our understanding around large organisations having worked at Google was that we knew businesses measure digital uh, experiences but they don't f often very much do anything with it. So I had spent many, many years sitting in two and three hour long sessions where a lot of people show a lot of information and a lot of numbers, but nobody really makes any decisions based on that. And really there's no point in, in reviewing numbers and reviewing information if you can't make decisions on it to help your business move forward. So that was our premise for the business four and a half years ago. Um, in 2015, we set up a training business which we've been doing in partnership with uh, the government out of Singapore and with Google. There is a shortage of digital analytics skills uh, across, across the APAC region actually, across the world really, and we're trying to help uh, facilitate training programs that bring this type of skill into businesses, either through becoming analysts or, or through becoming marketers. And then the final piece, which is uh, this year, is we've launched also a suite of products that help analysts do their jobs much more effectively so that they can focus on being very actionable and provide the right insights to a business rather than a lot around collecting and cleaning data and information, which takes a long time. Um, a little bit about me. So I am uh, not a digital native. I started my career as a television actress in Australia, which is the picture over here on that side. Um, <laughs> um, and I uh, had the ambition of becoming a uh, film actress, which obviously didn't turn out quite that way. And I remember when I was at university, I was doing a media degree and we had to set up a website. And I outsourced that task to a friend of mine because I said, I will never, ever need this skill in my life. So be careful. <laughs> Um, but then uh, after a few years in acting, I also did uh, theatre acting, I then landed a job at Google as a temp and I was only supposed to be there two days. I knew nothing about digital and I left nine and a half years later to now set up the business that we have today. Oops, going backwards. Okay, so a little bit about the landscape and um, at the moment a lot of what Sparkline does is with really large 
Fortune 500 organizations, but I think it's good for you to get a sense of the scale of what these guys are dealing with. So marketing used to be very much a communication function, and it's now become a real tech function. Uh, a few years ago, five years ago, there was 150 tools that marketers could use. There's now over 5,000 that they can use to do their jobs, and they are not equipped to know how to do those jobs effectively. So they're really struggling to understand how do I change what I know to be a tech function? How do I use data to make more decisions to reach people? And how, given how complicated customers are and how much choice they have, how am I gonna cut through and actually reach them when I don't have the right talent in the room to help me to do that? So it's a really large scale problem and it's only getting worse because if you think about how many devices you have with you, hands up if you have more than two devices with you today. The problem gets more and more complicated the more digitised the world gets. If your television, if your fridge can tell you that you've run out of milk, if your air conditioning unit knows that you've been for a run and will turn up the air conditioning unit by two degrees, all of that collects data and all of that creates information about you as a consumer that businesses are trying to figure out how to process in a way that they can make decisions off. I keep going backwards, sorry, I'll figure out how to use this. So, why, why, why measurement? Why, especially when you guys have, you're small businesses, you're not struggling with these problems uh, that these big businesses are? Well, the reason for you guys to make measurement is how are you going to stand out as a small business? How are you going to cut, cut through over and above competitors if they have more money or more budgets than you? How are you going to make your investors happy? Investors like to know where you're spending your money and to make sure that you're doing it in ways that are going to affect and change the business. So for you guys as you're starting out, here's some three key ways why you would focus on measurement as something that becomes embedded and ingrained in your business, especially as you grow. Understanding your audience is really key to success. Now, this is a screenshot of Google Analytics, but it doesn't need to be. It can be any type of measurement. But basically, when you measure, you make better decisions, full stop. If you're able to measure and you're able to say, why do I think this is happening? It means that you're not guessing. The hardest part about starting a business, and I know this myself, is, is it going to work? Am I going to be successful? And you have to guess, all those are guessing games. If you can be using actual data and information to help you make informed decisions, not only does it make you feel more confident in what you're trying to build, but it can also help you figure out how to grow and in different ways potentially, and I'll show you a couple of examples of those. But really what you want to think about as well is if you can measure and you can use free tools to do it, you can be a lot more accurate about the decisions you're making. You're not having to invest a whole ton of money like these big businesses are in a lot of very sophisticated tech. You can make very simple and fast decisions and you can get immediate results. Traditionally outside of digital measurement, you would have to do this via surveys. If you wanted to ask somebody and uh, create a particular product, you would have to put a paper survey in front of people, get them to answer questions, maybe even look and feel your product, take all of that back, process it manually, and then maybe a few months later come up with what you think is the result. It's too slow. You guys are in a digital world. It needs to happen immediately. So I wanted to show you this video and the, it's, it's actually quite an old example and I used to use it at Google but um, the, what I've been speaking about with big business, when I look at small businesses, I see a massive opportunity for small businesses and this is one that I want to show you um, is actually a video that was launched on YouTube uh, for a business that w went basically in direct competition with P&G just through this video alone. So it's going to help you to understand how when you understand your audience, when you understand the problem that you're solving and when in really clever ways you d use digital to get your message across, how successful you can be up and out when you're up against all these other big businesses with large budgets. Play the video. I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. 
And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. <laughs> So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gang, so when I'm coming to see you, see you. So obviously the type of content made for YouTube, right? Because it's not a TV commercial that you'd see traditionally. Who wants to guess the kind of impact that that video made? It's a, a sausage Whoop. competition that I judge. Oh. Sure. Uh, <laughs> does anyone want to have a guess before we go on to the next slide how, what impact that video itself made to PNG? Nope, I didn't acquire them. They're still going actually. Their sales dropped. Launched in 2012, it generated 12,000 new customers in 48 hours. It's been seen by 2 million people that pay anywhere from $1 to $9 and over 140 million in sales. It is now the market leader in men's blades, beating P&G's Gillette. So it's really clear, you're a small business, but P&G can't make videos like that, right? Their brand doesn't get away with doing things like that. And I say this to big businesses all the time. I am a small business. I can challenge you. I can send cupcakes to your developers so they do good work because I'm not bound by the politics of your business or, or what you're in. But technology democratizes the whole landscape. What you're going after as a small business is you know, you may not be going after the big guys, but you, you have the capability to disrupt very big traditional businesses using technology and using information to help you make informed decisions. And big businesses are scared of guys like you because of the ability for you to be agile and pivot and create cool content and to be able to use technology to get your message out there in the same way that these guys pay hundreds of millions of dollars to try and do every year. Who had seen that video, anybody? I get a bit scared showing it because it's a little bit old, but it's a really good example. <laughs> okay, so your first five tips for measurement. Surprisingly, your first tip actually has nothing to do with data. It's yourself. Why would I think that the first way to measure a business effectively would come from you? Because you're a consumer. Yeah. So a lot of times when I go and see a big business, I say, when is the last time that you went to your own website? When is the last time you searched for your own brand? When is the last time you got on your mobile phone and said, actually, is this a good experience? Just for me, just my opinion. When was the last time you turned around to a friend and said, maybe you're too close to your brand. Can you answer some questions for me? Was it easy to find things? Was it clear what I'm selling? Was it easy to check out? All those things that you guys complain about when you're online and you're saying this takes too long or I can't find it or it's confusing or I don't know what these people do, that's all feedback coming directly from yourselves or from your peers that can help you make better decisions about your experiences with your customers. So it's really simple. You two are a consumer. Use your own experience or if you feel you're too close to it, ask a family member or a friend and say, tell me what you think. What's your feedback? What would you change and why? The second one is search. So search is important and it's important for a number of reasons. I'm using this example of sana cleanse because I was recently on a juice cleanse for five days. So it was top of mind as I was preparing this. Um, but when I go through and think if I'm the owner of sana cleanse and people are going to search for juice cleansing, what, what kind of experience are they having? So you can see here I've got a web page over here. I have the same experience on mobile. 
and then I'm looking into more, I guess, generic related things. So I started with my brand. So if someone searches for my brand, if I spend money in a magazine or a TV ad putting my brand out there, how well is it known and how well am I dominating digital? Because if I'm not dominating this first page here, then potentially a competitor can. So am I, is my brand right? Can you see my website? Can you see an ad from me? Can you see an organic listing? Like, can you see my Facebook page, which you can here? How much of that front page am I taking up? And if I'm not taking up very much of it, what is the opportunity for somebody else to take that from me? Same in mobile. So is my experience on desktop exactly the same as what it is on mobile? As you guys know, we're in Southeast Asia. Mobile is first with everything. So if this experience isn't strong here, then you don't, you're not owning your brand in the digital realm. Somebody else might be. And then if you look at the category, like what category are you in? So in this, in this instance, these guys are a juice cleansing company in Singapore. So if I type in juice cleanse, where am I now? Am I still kind of top of mind here? Well, actually, I'm right down here. And there's three other people above me that are in the same category as me. So without even using any data at the moment, you're experiencing things like a customer. You can tell who your competitors are that are in your market. You can tell the types of experiences they're giving to customers. And you can see, well, where are my opportunities going to lie? How do I make sure that my brand is owned by me and me alone and nobody can step in? How do I make sure that for my key category, I'm not sitting at the bottom of a page or on page two or page three or page four? And if I know who these guys are, what can I learn from them that they're doing well or not doing well that I could change? If you think about that ad from, from Dollar Shave Club, the problem that they identified was shaving became too complicated. It didn't need to be like that. And that became their point of difference. So if you're trying to figure out what's my brand message or my brand value, you can start to have a look at what else is out there and say, well, what do I like and what don't I like? Do I see a gap in the market for this category? Can I own that part? Because what Dollar Shave Clubs owns is cheap razors. That's the category they own. Okay. Yes. Doesn't matter. It'll default, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, for a tip here, like obviously I've got just a couple of category things in here. Think about what are all the different ways people could try and find what you do. And test those. Test those variations. Are there different competitors that you can see? And that's really 10 minutes sitting in front of the TV saying, what are all the ways I think people could find what I do? And what can I learn from that? And do the same thing across social or your social platform, same thing. Where's my brand? What are the, some of the things that you would type in to find me? Who's there? What experiences are they giving to people? And YouTube. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. What type of content is being created around what I do? Is it good? Is it boring? Is it how-to videos? What kind of content is it? And that's, these are all your opinions. This is your research and it's all free and you're not, you're not even analyzing anything yet. You're not looking at any numbers yet. And brands don't do this. They wait for a report or a number to appear on their desk. These are ways in which you guys can be changing your business today and tomorrow without having to be an analyst and try and look at streams of data, which my analysts love to do and I hate doing because I would just rather the summary. I'm very impatient. So what did I learn from that experience? If I'm Sana Cleanse, these are the key things I learned just from that experience. I learned there's over 2 million results on Google for juice cleansers. So that probably means there's quite a lot of content out there. Probably means people are interested in my category and what I'm here to do. There are over 300,000 videos on how to juice cleanse on YouTube. So again, how large is my category? What type of content is all, all of this? Is there a point of difference for me there that people haven't thought of before? 
Does it validate that what I am selling is something that people want because people are already out talking about it? Sana Cleanse ads in blogs work well to dominate the brand, but Beauty Cleanse, which I saw come up a few times, just bought some ads against my brand. Are they a threat? Do I care? Are they someone I know? And all of these questions you have to ask yourself, there's no right or wrong, but when you're finding information, what do you do with that then? Because it's okay to say there's 300,000 videos on how to juice cleanse, but at the same time, do I care? So you have to think about when you're finding these data points, why is that important to me? Does it validate that I have a good business model or not? Does it say there's a lot of competition in market and am I afraid of that or do I feel like I'm creating points of difference? These are all questions as a business owner you need to ask yourself. In the last year, out of 536,000 YouTube results for Juice Cleanse, oh sorry, that's a mistake. There were 536,000 results for YouTube Juice Cleanse. 462,000 of them were in the last year. So what does that tell me? If I'm in the juice cleansing business, I've been able to see there's a total of 536,000 results for YouTube, juice cleansing, and 462,000 of them were in the last 12 months. Yeah, it's accelerating really fast. So on the one hand, I'm going to get excited because I have a juice cleanse business, and on the other hand, I'm going to completely freak out because I'm in the juice cleanse business. <laughs> so what do I do now? Okay, and then when I'm analysing some of the information in search, what are some of the terms that were related to my business? How competitive were these when I just played around while I'm watching TV? Because there's no right or wrong. Were there certain terms that were very competitive, certain terms that weren't? Is that an area of opportunity for me that nobody's tapping into yet? Do I want to compete against these guys or not? And finally, when I look at social... The hashtags people attach to are maybe your competitors or maybe the images yourself obviously relate to topics and they relate to topics that people are, are associating with what they see. How can you leverage those to make partnerships? Maybe you haven't thought about coupling products together in a certain way and already your audience is telling you through hashtags or how they describe this content that that's how they see your products and services together. Can you then create offerings around those that you haven't thought of before? No right or wrong, all things to think about and all really quick ways that you can be doing this stuff as you're sitting in front of the TV or you're on the train or, and you're building up that bank of information. Okay, the third one is speed. So you guys have probably been told this a lot but speed is very important and the quote at the top is from Amazon that says, a page low slowdown of just one second can cost that business 1.6 billion in sales each year. And you can check that really easily. You type into Google, check my speed. <laughs> you put your website in here and you put your mobile in here and it gives you your score. So for Sana Cleanse, they were 46 out of 100 and then they were 38 out of 100 for mobile. And Google does the generous job of giving you all the fixes as well and then prioritizing them by urgent, medium, Low. This is stuff that is important for your on-site experience. Think about how many times you haven't bought a product because that site was too slow. Anyone? Does everyone like waiting for pages to load? Do you just go somewhere else? I do. <laughs> so you very easy things, right? This is not brain surgery. This is to say... You're a customer yourself and that's why I said start with you because even though you're checking, you probably know some of this stuff. And you can be losing business just because of something like this before you're even log logging into Google Analytics and taking a look at everything else. This is simple stuff that can be fixed and it's hygiene but it's important because it can help you to make money. Otherwise, it's going to give your competitor money because people aren't that brand loyal. Okay, so what did I learn from this? I know that page loading time means that I can lose money. 
I know that it has a huge impact on conversions and loyalty because again, here's the thing. If I go to a site tomorrow and the page loads slow, I'll remember that for next time and think, do I really want to go back there? It was a terrible experience. And I'll give you a real life example. There is an online shopping portal in Singapore that I make my husband use because it frustrates me so much that I, f I physically get upset thinking about using it. <laughs> like I, I actually have an emotional reaction to it. So I say, I'll do the fruit and veg because I like that interface and everything works really quickly and you do everything else. People remember the experience. So if you, uh, if you know it's a problem, fix it fast so that you're not losing potential loyal customers. Um, if you decrease your page load time, you, want to, you, you should be able to increase your conversions. You can also do this using Google Analytics, but the way I've shown you is just a very quick and easy way to do it without having to log into a Google Analytics site. And then always aim to be improving the speed of your site. And what I can tell you across the board with all of these strategies is they're not just done once. And this is usually where big brands like McDonald's start crying because I say, you'll fix it today and in a month's time, something else will break. So you need to figure out what's your ongoing plan to do these checks. And if you're a small business, you won't have to do it as much as these large businesses that are really complicated. But digital doesn't fix problems. <laughs> digital helps you to get a leg up, but then you've got to figure out how to maintain. What's your maintenance program for your website? Because if you get a new competitor that comes on board and you're not aware they're there, they come and dominate you because you thought you had the market covered. It's happened many times before. Who knows Kodak? Kodak? Kodak that used to dominate cameras and photos. They went out of business because that whole mobile phone thing with the camera, that didn't seem to be that important to them. You're never going to win the war. You use this stuff to help you keep evolving. Okay, research. Research is really important. So there are a lot of online facilities for research, but if you're thinking about trying to reach a certain group of customers, you need to understand who they are, where they are, what they're doing. All of these sites are available online. So you can look them up, but Think With Google is one of them. And Think With Google is really interesting because they spend a lot of money doing third-party research. It's one thing that I miss about working there because I had so much of it. Um, but it is all available online. So for example, if you're about to launch your business in Thailand and you haven't thought about your social strategy, you're in trouble because Thailand has the highest Facebook penetration across the whole of APAC. And you can find this out using these types of tools. You can find out what type of audience am I trying to target? What kind of devices do they use? What things are they interested in? What do they buy online? What don't they buy online? What regions are they in? All of those things, people spend a lot of money researching on for, for you and it all sits within these types of sites. Facebook has a similar one. Gives you the same thing, all your customer research. And customer research is important because how are you going to reach them if you don't know who they are? How are you going to provide them the experience you want to provide them if you don't want to know what they want? Make sense so far? We're not even at Google Analytics yet. Um, same thing with YouTube, right? So look at YouTube. YouTube has a trends dashboard. I don't know if you guys have ever used this before. But you're thinking to yourself, um, I think I could deliver my product better if it was in a video format. Who is my audience? So I might say, I want to target people in Singapore. I think my audience 35 to 44. And I think there's male. What type of videos are those guys looking at? What type of numbers does it have against these pieces of content that say they like it? Can I learn something from that that says, when I'm going to create my video, can I learn from what's already been done? To say, what do these guys like to look at? And you can do it by category as well. So if you're selling cars, you look up within automotive. Okay, so again, I've gone through a lot of these, but what can I learn? I can look at what online sources people are using, and that can help me determine where I'm going to spend money or place emphasis when I want to target my audience. 
I can look at the devices they use, I can look at how they use those devices, I can look at the times of day they use those devices and decide if I want to market to them, what times of day might I want to talk to them so I don't have to try and talk to them all day and pay lots of money for it. I can compare videos, I can compare age, gender, location, discover what they're interested in. Um, I can look at the typical types of videos that have been consumed by my target market group and from there I can decide, now I have all this information, what am I going to do with it? And what you have to remember is actionability is key. You can know a lot about a lot of things, but if you don't know what to do with that, or you don't know the parts that you need to ignore, and I find out a lot of information like that, a lot of pieces of information that I think are very interesting, but either I haven't figured out what I want to do with it yet, or I think actually that's just interesting information and I can't do anything with that. Actionability is key to your success. If you cannot figure out how to action this information, then it's just information. So with everything, you're always thinking about, now that I know this, what can I do with it? Or now that I know this, I may not know what to do with this today, but I'm going to park it somewhere so I can come back to it later. Okay, and number five, who's used Google Trends before? Google Trends, if you are not an analyst, is your friend. And I am not an analyst. So Google Trends is my friend. We used to uh, talk about a scenario at Google where Google would be able to tell what times of year were most popular for people to propose and how long it took to search for wedding dresses. And so what we would be able to show is up here it would have engagement rings and up here it would have wedding dresses. And engagement rings kind of went, where's my little graph here? Engagement rings kind of went like that and like that. What do you think that means? Searches for <laughs> engagement rings were not that long. Wedding dresses, however, went <laughs> like this. Yeah, you know. You're not going to spend long looking for that engagement ring. But once she's engaged, she's going to spend tons of time looking for that wedding dress. So trends is really cool because actually what it's based on is what people type in when they search. And why that's important is it shows intent. You never go to Google just to hang out there. Right? You go there because you want something. And you want to find it fast and then you want to leave. So what this shows is all the different types of search terms that people are typing in when they're looking for something and that shows they have the intent to buy something or they have the intent to show interest. So if I go back to my juice cleanse analogy, I typed in three things. Juice cleanse, which is in blue, eat clean and raw diet. And you can see, this is your time bar down here. I don't know how we can see it, but it's over a year. Now, you can break this down, provided the data is available. You can break it down by country and by month as well. And it'll also show you at the bottom of a page the regions where most of these types of terms are coming from. So if you want to launch a global business, you may be able to see that, for example, in Australia, it's far more popular than anywhere else in the world right now. So I would start there because they're showing intent. So I can see over a period of time, basically what I can see here is if I try to start my business, is that 2012, I think? I don't think I would have been in business for very long. Because nobody really was interested. But if I kind of knew once I kicked off that I started my business here, I might be first to market. which means I can dominate the industry a lot faster than anybody else. So I'll give you an example as well of Betty Crocker using this out of the US. Who knows those guys? They're a baking company and they basically put um, cakes in packets so that you only have to add an egg and uh, some water and some milk, which is exactly how I bake. So it works very well for me. <laughs> Um, but they, they had a, a huge foothold and still do in the US for baking goods. And they used this to show trends for gluten-free baking. 
and they would start to see a search trend of people started to look more for gluten-free sweets, desserts, products. And they were the first ones to develop a line of gluten-free cookies. And that's all they did. They came to Google Trends and went, I wonder what's happening in the gluten-free world. So again, when you're sitting at home watching TV or doing nothing, and this is why I love this tool so much, because I'm not an analyst, I can say, what are people showing Google that they're intending to do in my category? And I do the same thing. I look, I look after Google Analytics, I look after Adobe Analytics. I come here and say, are people more interested in Adobe Analytics or Google Analytics in Malaysia? And if it's more Google Analytics, then do I want to launch my training program, which we're doing with Magic, in Malaysia first, because I know they're more interested. Does this make sense? And there's no wrong answers either. So you can type stuff in and, and it might not show you anything at all if it doesn't have enough information, but that's okay, then you eliminate it. Okay. So I've already told you all the things you can learn from this, so I'm going to move forward. But there's lots of cool stuff you can learn from um, Google Trends, so I would definitely explore it. And your bonus before I go into GA is obviously social analytics. So we know, without me having to go through this graph, how massive social is globally, but especially in Southeast Asia. And I gave you a little anecdote on Thailand for Facebook. I always say to Thailand, if Facebook aren't visiting you very, very regularly, there's a problem because these guys dominate the Facebook market. But there's a lot you can learn. So who here already has presence for their business on social? Who's looking at any of the data behind it? So very easily these guys, all of them, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you can be looking without being an analyst at things like what's my age group, what are my engagement rates without launching any ads? What, what kind of countries are viewing my content? And be able to tie the pieces together to make decisions on who your consumers are. So look at this stuff, Facebook Insights. It's all there, it's immediate. It'll show you what happened today, it'll show you what happened yesterday. It can also help decide on what your posting strategies are, right? So if you know your highest engagement is between 8 and 10 p.m., then that's when you post. If you know that majority of the audience that is consuming your content are female between a certain age group, maybe the photo that you release or maybe the messaging you release is purely aimed at that. Um, if when you, yeah, tw it, within Twitter, you can search for Twitter analytics, it'll show you. And same, and Facebook analytics is there. Um, Instagram doesn't have their own analytics at the moment but you can there's a lot of third-party tools there's three or four third-party tools that will help you measure Instagram that are free as well these are all free uh, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know what this one was actually yeah there's three or four I'm sorry it's not like a um, but they all have it and if you're if you're engaging in social even if you're not doing social ads start learning about who your audience is because they're telling you. You just have to take the time to look at the information and say, what is this trying to tell me and then what decision again can I make off it? Okay, so they're your first five and not one little number was shown. So you guys can actually be analysts and analyse your business without any analytics capability at all. Who knew? Okay, so the next ones I'm going to go into are specifically related around GA. And the reason that we talk about GA is GA is owned by about 70% of websites globally. Um, and the reason is primarily because it's free. And I can tell you a little bit of story about GA. Um, the original company was called Urchin, and they were a company out of San Diego, and it was my husband's company. Small world. And I often joke that it's probably him that should be running this business and not me, but that's a joke aside. Um, so his company was acquired by Google um, and then they turned what was a paid for product into a free product 
for everybody to be able to use. Um, and that was 2000, if I'm getting my dates right, 2004. Yes. Um, so Google Analytics is, is used, it's, it's often coupled with paid products as well. So if you talk to a lot of businesses, they have a paid, there is a paid version of Google Analytics. There's a free version of Google Analytics and then there's paid versions of other web analytics tools and some businesses couple them together. What Google Analytics is really good at is telling you information about your customers because what they do is also give you all the information that Google knows about you as you search and to be able to categorize you. So and you can test how, well Google, how accurate Google is at this. If you go to google.com forward slash ad preferences, I think, um, it'll show you how it categorizes you based on your search history. Male, female, age group, interested in, in the market for all of those things. Google's also really good at marketing and advertising um, data because you're able to say to Google, I want to find a certain subset or segment of my audience and then I only want to market to those guys. So say for example, I'm Zalora, who we work with, I only want to retarget all the people that went to the third stage of the funnel with handbags and didn't buy. Send them an ad for an offer that gives them 15% off if they purchase today. And have you ever wondered that when you see ads? When you go to like book a flight and all of a sudden that same company is just following you around the internet for like weeks? <laughs> it's a bad strategy actually, but, <laughs> but businesses do it. That's remarketing. So they take data from GA or similar and say, show me this segment. Now go send only those guys specifically a message because I want them to come back and buy my products. Okay. So the first step that I'm going to talk about is something really boring and I call it get organized. Um, we had a question earlier actually before the session about a company that is selling used furniture. Where, is, where are those guys? Are they here? Maybe they left, I'm not sure. Um, used furniture online and they were saying they don't know how to use the information that they have in their GA account to make a decision. And I said, well, how good is your information? So analysts don't have a crystal ball. They're only as good as the information they have. If you have bad data, you are going to make bad decisions. And if you don't have the right data, you can't make any decisions. So that's why we call it garbage in, garbage out. You will often be told when you set up a website that you have GA on your website. Who has a website and has been told this? Okay, no one in the room. Why did anyone come to a GA session? <laughs> um, but what often happens is a developer puts a piece of code on your website, which is fine, but the problem is that developer didn't at all think about my business. He just said, you've got tracking on your website. So I can see all the people that come to my website, but I can't see anything else. What decision can I make off that? If someone says to me, you had 5,000 people that came to your website today, what decision can I make off that? Nothing. But if I could say, 5,000 people came to my website today, and again, I'm going back to my cleanse analogy, and I know that 2,000 of them looked at this product that was $12, and 500, 500 of them looked at this product that was worth $530, would I be able to treat those customers a bit differently? Would I say, I'm actually more willing to go after these guys to make sure they purchase than these guys because they're of higher value to me. And all of that is, is making sure that when you're setting up any type of analytics, that it's actually tracking the things that are important to you as a business because you need to make decisions on that information. It's the same as what's over here. This is a purchase funnel, three steps. I put something in my basket, I then go to pay and then I check out. If my developer did not consider this, I see none of this. So maybe a lot of these guys did put something into a shopping basket, but maybe the form was too long, or maybe my site was too slow, 
or maybe the information was too confusing, how would I know? I'm not going to know because there's no information on it at all. So getting your house in order and getting organised is really important and understanding what you need to be tracked in order for you to make decisions. Because otherwise, you can't. The second part of this is, in Google Analytics, you can track 3,000 things. Can you make decisions on 3,000 data points? No. So what you need to do is to say, what are my top 15 to 20 things that are the most important to my business? And how we do it, and what I'm showing you here, is a KPI framework. So when we talk to customers, we say, what's the customer journey? So we've got guys that are right at the beginning of the journey, We've got guys that are evaluating products. We've got guys in acquisition phase. And then how do I create loyalty? Now, what big businesses still do to this day is they say, whatever channel made the purchase gets all my money. But you and I both know you guys don't shop like that. You guys might see an ad as you're walking past a bus stop. You might see the same ad in a magazine. You might see an ad on TV. You're using 100 different devices to influence your decision. So to basically ignore everything up until a purchase means that you're not able to actually figure out how to make incremental small changes in your business that can have a big impact. By creating frameworks like this, you can do that. So you can say, these are certain things I might want to track at the beginning of the funnel, and then these are certain things I want to track at the end of the funnel. Now, there's no right or wrong here. This is you sitting down with whoever it is on your team or you as a business and saying, obviously, I want to make money. Every business wants to make money. So obviously, I'm going to track revenue. I'm going to track sales. But what are the other things that I think are going to import, be important to track that if I had to fight for them, and that's the other thing that you do, you really have to fight for them because when I talk to businesses, they say, let's just have 70. I'm like, we're not having 70. We're having 20. Because if you have 20 things that you're going to look at regularly, you can make decisions on these things. And then all the other stuff is nice to have, but it's noise for now. When you say how many likes you get on your Facebook page, does that make you money? So you've got to think about how important that is and say, I might want to look at that. That might be cool for me to show all my friends and say, look how many likes I got. It's <laughs> awesome. But you've got to think about what's actually going to make you money or what you do with that information to help you make money. So these type of frameworks are really good to explore. How can I consolidate what I need to track into 15 to 20 top things that I want to track for my business? Demographics. So this is actually a, um, a condition. It's called prosopagnosia. It's taken me two years to figure out how to say that. And basically, it's a disease where people cannot see faces features on faces. So when they see you and I, they see this. This also happens in analytics. We use the word users, like as everyone's drug addicts, right? We don't really talk about people and, and we're, we're in the business of communicating with people. It doesn't matter what business you have. You've got to communicate with people in order for them to want to buy your products or, your, or, sell, or be a part of your services. So in Google Analytics, it is very easy for you to know who the people are. And I'm not also not a technical person. It is a click of a radio button that unlocks all this very rich information that will show you your age group. It will show you whether they're male or female. It will show you where, where they're coming from. And again, when we're trying to think about making decisions, isn't it much easier to make decisions when you actually know a little bit about these people than it is if you just know them as users So what can I do with this? And this is a real life example. So if I go back to here, Amari Hotels has a predominant audience of female, 25 to 34. What might I do with that information? Before I get to this. Yeah, so you can start to look at what is my experience that's reflecting this age group? But Google Analytics will give you information that goes even further. 
and it will show you things like how many of those people um, are female or male. It will show you how many of them are newer sessions and new people. It will show you the people that came to your site and just left. It will show you how many pages they looked at and they will show you how long they took to be there. Now what I can already tell from this, because I don't need everything, but what I can tell is that there's more females that are visiting than men, so that's good. And out of that, the females are actually more engaged across the board than men. And what that helps me to say is not only do I know they're female and they're 25 to 34, but I actually know they're more engaged and I know there's more of them, which gives me an incentive to take an action. These were the ads. Images changed. Female, female, family. Packages changed. Family packages, shopping packages, probably female escaping their children packages. <laughs> I'll go for that one. <laughs> so that the, the, the product offerings are the same, but the way they're positioned is different using this information. Okay, the third one is know their interests. So you now know how old they are, you know their gender, you know where they've come from. But you can also know from Google Analytics because they, as I said, if you look at ad preferences, you'll be able to tell the things that you're interested in. You can also tell what they're in the market to buy and what they're interested in. So I'm going to use a smartphone retailer. This is a real example of how we use this information. So this smartphone retailer, we can see that their affinity category, i.e. what they're interested in, are all these things, they like movies, they like travel, they like TV. And if you looked at just this here, you would say, well, actually I've got more movie lovers um, and more travel buffs and more news junkies. So that's the information I'm going to take. Now you can take that information, but if you track revenue, if you can transact online, Google will also tell you the categories that are more valuable to you from a revenue standpoint because they have that information. So in this case, actually, we said instead of going after these three, which you can still do, there's no wrong way to do this, I think you should focus on the ones that seem to be more revenue generating. So in which case, these guys are the technophiles and these guys are shutterbugs, people that love cameras, and these guys are music lovers. You guys following me so far? You're only as good as the information you have, so you may not have all this information, but if you do, if you have the revenue information, you can say, this is not just a volume game, this is a what is the value to my business game. The second one is I'm in the market to buy. What am I in the market to buy? So out of this, the top three in the market to buy, obviously they're a smartphone company, consumer electronics, that's kind of a no-brainer. They're also in the market for a new job and they're also in the market to buy a car. And then if I go the layer deeper than that, I say, actually, yes, that's my top three, but what Google's telling me is of all the revenue that I generate per session, the, the two categories that are the revenue generating ones actually relate to computer equipment, accessories, and they relate to apparel and accessories. So what can I do with this information? Is everyone asleep? I know it's the end of the day. <laughs> All right, I'll take the answer away from you. So let's summarize. The ones that were the highest revenue generating for this smartphone company in terms of interests are people in interested in technology, people that are interested in cameras, and people that are interested in music. If I sell smartphones, what could I do with that? Shout out. Free music, right? If I know they're in the market for apparel and tech accessories, let's take tech accessories, what could I do with that? Bundle. Bundle, Bundle my product offerings. 
So over here I can say I can put the camera front and centre and highlight those features because I know these people are interested in the camera feature of the phone. I could put speaker quality because I know they all like music. I could have um, HD photos that I can store on the device, like how many can I store? And I can start advertising how many songs can the device hold. So what's the power of the device, not just by saying this is how much memory you have, but this is how many songs it can store? Because I know you guys like music. So your features and what you highlight when you market these can all come out of the information that you get and how you bundle products and couple products and say, well, I know anyone looking at a smartphone is also interested in accessories. I'll, dump, I'll bundle them together or I'll discount those accessories or they get an iTunes voucher for this month only when they buy the phone. Okay, we're nearly there. The fourth one is testing. So there's a lot of data that you are going to find and even the examples that I've shown you that give you ideas for what you can do. Again, I said at the beginning of the session, there's no crystal ball to any of this. You find out information about your customer and then you say, what could I do with this information? And you may have six things, but you're never going to know if they work until you test them. And the beauty of technology is you can test and if it's a mistake, you fail fast. You pull it and you eliminate it. And there's nothing wrong with that because actually the tests that fail also help in a process of elimination, right? They're valuable in themselves. So this is a real life example of a skydiving company we worked with out of Australia. This was their form to fill in. Um, and what we could see in Google Analytics is that everybody dropped off here. Everyone was interested in going skydiving. They just weren't interested in giving us any information to actually complete the order. So the intuition on that is, is this too long? Do you need to know their address at this time, really? when they're booking a skydive, do you need to know where they live? Yes, no. And so you start to question that. Legally, do you need this for any reason? No. Do you think you'd really need this information now? Are you going to send them a mail or anything? No. Okay, well then let's test. And in one month, by doing this test, we basically said, here was the original form. And all we said was, what do you actually really need? Well, really, you need their name, their email and their phone number, because then you can get in touch with them. And in one month through doing this test, their sales went up, their revenue went up by 14% and their transactions went up by 15%. Very small change, remove three forms. The fifth one is really easy, keep up to date. So if you're going to use these technologies, they change all the time. Every month there's new features. That, that demographic example I gave you, I had said to a very large organisation, large business, you don't have demographic information in Google Analytics. They said, yeah, I don't know, we probably have to tag it to get it set up. I said, no, it's a radio button. Log in today, click here, and you have this huge amount of rich information. So if you can keep up with how these products develop, then you're also able to take advantage as new features come out and it'll help you get richer and richer information that'll help you do your job more effectively or you hire somebody to do it for you, that's the next stage. <laughs> um, and then there's a lot of support online for, for analytics. Um, I know analytics isn't your full-time job, but today's exercise was really to show you that there's a lot you can do without having to be an analyst. There's a lot of research you can do, especially if you're in the stage of just starting out your business to validate if you have a good business. There's a lot of information out there that'll help you decide on how to make better experiences so that you can increase sales. And really the key thing is be actionable, be practical, be simple. Don't try and reinvent the wheel um, because all of this is incremental changes that will help you progress. So your bonus for this is if you do have GA, these would be the top kind of three category reports that I would at least start with to look at. And they're all based around your audience, your acquisition channels and the type of behaviour. They're the key ones. And this is your summary. You can always analyze without being an analyst. Search, 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 keep searching. Optimize for speed. Do your research. There's a lot of research out there. Use trends as a barometer for intent, your customer intent or your potential customer intent. Get organized, clean house, make sure you've got the right setup if you've got a website so that you can actually see information you can make decisions on. 
Know your audience, look at the demographics, know what they're interested in, know what they want to buy. That helps you position your products and services. Test, 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 test. I should say that as much as search, search, search. Um, and invest in knowledge, keep up to date. Thanks, guys.